Icarus by Donovan Barnes Icarus faced in the direction of the flames that engulfed his monastery, and even though he was blind and could not see, he could tell by the growing warmth in his face that his home was almost gone. Resent and anger filled the blind monk as he observed his home of twenty years decaying in the fire, a strange set of emotions considering he was the arsonist. His understudy observed the horrific sight from his knees tears streaming down his young face with desperate sobs to accompany them. The wind carried a burning ember from the fire to Icarus's habit, and upon seeing it burn a hole into his teacher's clothing, the young understudy shuffled on his knees to where Icarus was standing. He desperately tried to brush the ember from the cloth, but to no avail. It had burned its way through the cloth. Icarus slapped his understudy on the top of his bald head in rebuke, not wanting a moment of mourning to be interrupted by childish wailing. What will it be, son? Icarus said, now stroking the head of his understudy paternally. Why would God do such a thing, teacher? The understudy asked. The fire intensified as it claimed the roof of the monastery, and as it did, the heat on Icarus's face became so unbearable that it caused him to turn from the fire, bend over and clutch his face in his hands. He screamed. Even though he had turned from the fire, the burning on his face intensified. His understudy thought he had been hit by another ember, for the intensity of the increasing fire had done little to affect him. Master, are you hurt? he asked. Icarus could not respond. He was now clawing at his face, unable to rid himself of the heat, which was now retreating from the rest of his face to settle in his eyes. He let out a desperate scream and then stood up, scratching at his neck violently. The understudy, still on his knees, looked up at his teacher, not moving to aid him because he thought the ailment to be spiritual torment and not physical harm. Master, he cried. Icarus had forgotten his understudy was there. He felt different, as though his resolve had been strengthened. He felt so different that it was of no surprise to him when he looked at his understudy and could see his face. Not in the same way he had been able to see when he was young. This was different. Master, your eyes, your eyes, they are burning, the understudy cried. Icarus was not shocked. He knew they were burning. He had seen this happening when he was ten years of age, at the time he had begun to lose his sight. He looked around, his back to the fire, and though it was night, he could see clearly, as if it were day. The moon looked like the sun, its lights beaming across the skies. The stars were just as piercing, and both night lights illuminated the landscape before him like the light of a hundred suns. Hearing the crackling of the rampaging fire behind him, Icarus turned. There was no more resentment. There was only a stolid determination to set out on his life's mission. Master, come back, master, please, the understudy cried out to Icarus as he walked towards the burning building. He entered the flame, but they did not touch him. He could only feel a faint heat. In the back room of the monastery was the only thing he needed before he could embark on his journey the sword that had been left with him by a dying knight, who on return from battle had sought refuge at the monastery. The understudy looked on in horror as his teacher emerged from the fire, his eyes burning red in the night and his hands clutching a sword in its sheath. Father, what has happened to you? Is this the work of the devil? It is not, my boy. It is the work of redemption, Icarus replied. The two men made their way through the forest, Icarus leading the way and his understudy whimpering as he followed. Henry, you are not a child. Stop this. You must accept fate and move on. Otherwise I will abandon you in the wild and offer you something to weep about, Icarus yelled. Henry was shocked. He had never heard his master speak like this. A few hours before dawn, the two wanderers found an opening in the foliage, where they made a fire and settled to sleep. Icarus closed his eyes and immediately found the slumber that he desired. Henry jumped at every sound, an owl hooted and he jolted. He lay shivering in the cold of the night, lamenting the loss of his home, and angry with the godless creature who had emerged from it as it had burnt down. They only had one flask of water, but Henry had decided that he would rather die from thirst than travel any further with this demon. He snuck over to the flask of water, taking it over to where Icarus lay asleep. 
Icarus jumped onto his feet, shocked by the assault by water, his face drenched. What is the meaning of this? he screamed. Father, I thought that by wetting the fire in your eyes I would be getting rid of the demon that is tormenting us. Henry cried. You stupid boy, I have told you that this is not the act of the devil. Have you no faith in your teacher? Henry was now on his knees before Icarus as dawn's first light crept over the horizon. As the sun's light became visible, Henry watched as the fire in his master's eyes began to die, flickering weakly until it was gone. The pale eyes of a blind man was all that was left, and it seemed to Henry that his master had lost vitality too, his shoulders drooping and the wrinkles in his face returning to their fullest. Father, the fire in your eyes, it's gone. The water worked, it's a miracle, Henry said. Icarus touched his eyes. He looked sad again, like he had when he first observed the monastery burn. He took Henry's arm, the young man leading his blind master through the foliage. Have you my sword? Icarus asked. I do, father, Henry replied. Whatever you do, do not lose it. But we are men of the cloth. What use do we have for such things? I tell you now, my boy, that as we stand, we are not men of the cloth any more. We are men of God. The nearest village was still a few days' walk, and without water the two nomads had to find a natural source of water imminently. I will only slow you down, boy. You go ahead and find water. I will remain here, Icarus said. But how will I find you again? Henry asked. Take the sword with you and cut a mark into the trees as you go. Henry went on his way, his master already kneeling for his daily prayers. Henry was worried for his master. He had not seen him like this before. He had decided that when they reached the village, he would tell the priest there what had happened. Maybe he could help his teacher. The sun had started to retreat by the time Henry heard the trickling sound of water ahead of him. Overjoyed by the sound of life, he dropped a sword and ran towards it. The water was not as close as it seemed, and by the time Henry found the stream, darkness had descended over the land. He dropped to his knees, and with cupped hands carrying water, he fed his thirst. He drank so quickly that he vomited, and after he did, he drank some more. It was only when he had quenched his thirst that Henry realised how great a mistake he had made. With no markings in any of the trees around him, he realised he was lost. His search for the last mark he had made on the tree was a sluggish one. In fact, he had come so close to the last mark that, if he had just walked a few more steps further, he would have found the sword and the marked tree next to it. But instead, he consoled himself in the fact that his master had defected to darkness, and that it was fate that Icarus should die, and that he, Henry, should live. Henry slept so close to the river that night, that had he been just a little deeper in sleep, he, not being able to swim, would have drowned in the water as it rose. Feeling the water beneath him, he rolled, fortunately, away from the river, and rose to his feet in shock. He wondered if he had been threatened with death for leaving his blind teacher behind. He lay back on the ground, further from the river, rocking himself to sleep. Henry woke to the morning song of the birds and the light drizzle falling in waves in his face. The first thing he did was fill his belly with water, and then once it was, he found shelter under a large tree and tried to ignore the hunger that had begun to gnaw at his stomach. He had been so happy to have found water that he had forgotten the necessity of food to sustain him. Icarus and Henry had been fasting for two weeks before the night that the monastery burnt down, and now the weakness in Henry had become so great that he had neither the energy to search for the nearest village or attempt to forage for food. He lay under the tree, accepting God's judgment on him for abandoning Icarus. Henry had been sleeping through most of the day when he woke abruptly, his sleep interrupted by the song of three women. Life is brought from water spring, a source of praise and songs to sing. And although we all need food to eat, to quench your thirst is the greatest treat. Henry sees his life at end, but we come fast with a hand to lend. Do not fret death's looming hand, for we can offer you new life and land. In exchange for this we ask one thing, your master's sword to us must bring. Henry looked across to the other side of the river. Three beautiful women were bathing naked, singing and splashing each other with childish delight. Behind them were woven baskets filled with every culinary delight that one could think of. Henry stood up wearily, wondering whether he was still dreaming. The pain as he pinched himself confirmed to him that he was not. 
How do you know my name? Henry asked. The three women swam over to the middle of the river and rose so that the level of the water reached their hips, their breasts scarcely covered by their long hair. What kind of magic is this? Henry asked. Please, Henry, one question, only one, they replied. What do you want from me? Did you not hear? said the woman to the left. Henry, we want your master's sword, that is all. Then you can come and join us for a banquet. We have great influence in the village, you know. Why wander hopelessly with your teacher? You have no place left, and you never wanted to be dressed in dreary cloth. We can help you start anew, the woman in the middle said. If I bring you the sword of Icarus, then you will help me? Henry asked. Oh, he is such a clever young man, isn't he? Yes, Henry, that is what we propose, they replied. The eyes of Icarus, the naked woman, they were all delusions as far as Henry was concerned, delusions that came from starvation. There were probably a few well-meaning village girls that wanted to help him. The song and the nakedness were his own imaginings, though why they asked for the sword was beyond him. Henry walked through the forest until night, at which point he tucked himself underneath the exposed roots of a giant tree, content to sleep and return in the morning with the sword. Henry tossed and turned as sleep evaded him. He dreamt of a sharp point at his throat and woke to realise the danger was in fact real. Icarus stood over him, his eyes burning brightly. You are wretched, Icarus bellowed. Please, father, I was lost. Icarus pushed the tip of the sword harder into his understudy's throat. You are not worthy of your station. How did I think you could accompany me on this journey when at the first sign of thirst you run? Icarus pulled the sword away from the traitor sheathing it before he turned and walked away. Father, please, I was tricked by three demons. They came in the form of beautiful women. They deceived me. I beg forgiveness. Icarus stopped walking. You mean what you say? Yes, I swear it. Lead me to them, Icarus commanded. But it is dark and I cannot see. Yet I can. We are near what appears to be the last mark that you made. How far is it from here? Not far. Walking away from the marked tree, which should only require a few moments before you hear the water rushing. Get up. The forest was ablaze with light as Icarus made his way to the river. It was as Henry had promised. A few moments of walking and Icarus heard the sound of water. Drawing closer, he heard the sound of women giggling in the distance. So you speak the truth. What do they want from you? All they asked was that I found your sword and bring it to them. Icarus left Henry behind as he made his way stealthily to the river and the sound of women. When he reached the last layer of foliage, he crouched and watched them as they cavorted in the water, splashing each other. One of the women stopped and pointed at the bush where Icarus was hiding, whispering to her companions between childish giggles. When they finished their song, Icarus stood with both hands resting on the hilt of his sword. Oh, his eyes are as pretty as they say. Who are you? Icarus asked. What are you? they replied. This is not a game for children. Henry may not swim, but I certainly do. And if you beeth not man, then I will not think twice before I sever your heads from your bodies. Now speak, what do you want with my sword? Icarus cried out. Ooh, you are a fearsome man, but I am afraid that we cannot give you the answer to such a question unless you first give us the sword, they replied. Do not say that I have not given you due warning, Icarus said. He made his way to the bank of the river and entered the water, wading over to the three women. When he arrived at the centre of the river, it became too deep to stand and he was forced to swim, burdened by the habit he was wearing. Feeling heavier, he tried to undo the rope around his waist, but starvation had sapped his strength and he felt himself sinking. Although his lungs were filled with water, his eyes were open and the underwater was luminous as he saw the three women approaching him. The first one pulled the sword out of the sheath and swam away, whilst the other two embraced him tightly, humming a tune as they did. Blackness came and the fiery lights around him faded as he accepted death. Icarus opened his eyes. He could tell it was dawn by the fact that he could no longer see. Darkness his companion once again. His habit was soaked, making it heavy and burdensome. He stood up, using the support of a nearby tree. Father, are you hurt? Henry yelled in the distance. No, where are you, my boy? Icarus replied. I'm here, father, on the other side of the river, but I cannot swim. 
The rain has stopped. Has the water level dropped? Icarus asked. Yes, it has, but I fear the middle depths that I may not be able to stand. There is only one way to know. If it becomes too deep for you to wade across, then turn around, and you have risked nothing. I am scared of the water, father. Why is it that you fear the fire? You will die if you stay there. You must come. Henry knew it was true, and so he made his way across the river. When he reached the middle, he felt the water too deep to walk across, and so he blew the last remaining air from his lungs and walked as far as he could along the riverbed. When he ran out of breath, he pretended to breathe in order to trick his mind, and just as he was about to give up and swallow water, his bald head began to emerge from the water. I made it, father, Henry spluttered. So you have. Now come here and tell me what is left of the demons that tried to drown me, Icarus replied. Henry searched the area and found no signs of anyone having been there. He looked over at a nearby tree and noticed the black leather sheath hanging from a branch with a sword still in it. Father, your sword is hanging from the tree branch. Well, don't stand there, go and fetch it. Icarus held the sword, rubbing his fingers over the new inscription in the blade. He could not see it, but Henry had told him that the inscription was gold-plated, a sentence in a language that he had never seen before. The three women had saved his life and adorned his sword. He did not know why, and nor could he arrive at a reasonable conclusion. The two men sat eating a loaf of bread that had been left below the hanging sword, and made a vow not to share what they had seen with anyone lest they should be executed as magicians or sorcerers. The younger man led his blind companion through the forest until finally they arrived at a road. I don't know whether we should go left or right, father. Both would be a waste of energy. If this is a road, then we shall soon find travellers, and when we do, we can ask them which way it is to the nearest village, Icarus replied. The two sat on the side of the road. Icarus established a watch and nominated himself as the first to sleep. Henry grew bored and began to throw rocks across the road, trying to hit a snail that hung off the edge of a leaf. On the fifth row, he hit the snail, shattering its shell and sending it further into the shrubbery. Henry took a strange delight in the damage he had caused, feeling himself slightly godlike in his ability to meter out life or death. Deciding he had dealt enough destruction for the day and feeling a little peckish, he dug into the bag where the last remaining rations of bread were and helped himself to an amount that he thought would go unnoticed. Having eaten his full, Henry lay down, thinking it a more sustainable position from which he could watch for the approach of passers-by. The bread sat well in his stomach, so well that the fullness lured him into a deep sleep, leaving both Henry and Icarus oblivious to the comings and goings of the road. Icarus was woken by the sound and vibration of galloping horses. Henry, who is approaching? Icarus asked. There was no answer. Henry, he shouted. Henry woke up startled, and seeing the approaching riders, he jumped to his feet and waved them down. Several knights came to a halt in front of them. What is the matter, boy? the first knight asked. Sir, the father and I were wondering which way it is on the road to the nearest village, Henry asked, helping Icarus onto his feet. Forgive me, father, I did not see you. Please, we are on our way to the nearest village to stop for food and water. Allow us to escort you there. That is far more than I would have asked, bless you, Icarus replied. Icarus and Henry were both pulled onto horseback, and the entourage made their way at a great pace to the next village. Icarus had his arms wrapped around the gigantic knight mounted in front of him. He felt sorry for any man that would have to encounter this Goliath in the field of battle. For even though he could not see the man, he could easily profess that he was the largest man that Icarus had ever encountered. After travelling through the day, the knight stopped on the side of the road to eat and rest. The knight who was leading Icarus got off his horse and helped the abbot to the ground with a gentleness unbecoming of a man of his stature. We are greatly indebted to you for your generosity, Icarus said. Did Christ not say that to help his followers meant that he himself would bless the man who performed the good deed? Therefore is it not God who I should look to for reward and not you, Father? The knight replied. I see that you are wise and well read in teachings of our Lord. What name do I call you by knight? Icarus asked. I am Falk, a knight from a land I do not expect you to know, he replied. 
And what do you do so far from land you do not expect me to know? Icarus asked. I am travelling to join Godfrey of Bouillon's army, to answer the call of the Pope to retake Jerusalem from the heathen, Falk replied. And how many knights do you have in your company? Icarus asked. I am but one. The rest of these men are wealthy peasants, who have decided in their zeal to invest in the apparatus of a warrior and move on to do God's will. Men at arms, Icarus stated. Correct. And you, Abbot, where do you go and why are you so far from your monastery? Falk asked. I am no longer an abbot, for my monastery has been sacrificed in the flame of an unrelenting fire. I am a man of God, as you are, and God has put in my heart a quest as he has in yours. And where does your quest take you? To a land I have not been. Well, I know when a clear answer is not forthcoming. As for me and the men that are with me, we will protect you as far as Jerusalem, if it is your wish. The whole of Christendom moves to the Holy Land, and you being a man of God, surely you would move with Christendom. Your offer of protection is a blessing. I ask to ride in your company until we reach the village. Then I will burden you no longer. As you wish, Falk responded. The men sat around a crackling fire, roasting a wild boar that had exposed itself on the open road and had been shot just as quickly as it did. The day's light was in retreat, and Icarus needed to find a separate area to sleep in. Henry had made it near impossible for Icarus to excuse himself from the main party, as he asked them a myriad of questions regarding Pope Urban's commands and what battle would be like. Henry, I think these men have had enough of questions of battle from a monk. It's time that we went to pray and put our heads to rest, Icarus said. Sorry, Father. Henry replied, getting up from the fire to join his teacher. If you are to pray, why not lead us in prayer? Falk suggested. I hope that you will excuse me. We are still in mourning over the destruction of our monastery, and as such we see it fit to spend a certain amount of time in isolation, Icarus said. Forgive my insensitivity, Falk replied, taking a large chunk out of a piece of meat shortly after, chewing loudly with his mouth open. Icarus and Henry made their way into seclusion, close enough that they would be able to find the others in the morning. Father, you cannot hide your eyes from the world forever, Henry said. Hold your tongue. I won't be lectured to by you, boy, Icarus replied. For even though what Henry had said was true, Icarus could sense the monk decline into irreverence for hierarchy, a regression that would become more difficult to control as the journey continued. Icarus knew what he had been called to find, only by the faint memory of visions from his youth. He had been summoned from a young age to take this perilous journey, and he had known, even from then, that unless his beloved monastery was destroyed, he could never bring himself to leave it behind. He took solace in what he had done from Christ's teaching, if your right hand should hinder you, chop it off. As the moon became visible, so did the fire in Icarus's eyes. The night became day to him and he could not sleep. Henry watched his master, wide-eyed from where he lay, shivering violently with fear. He knew that the only godly thing to do was to expose his master, but it seemed that Icarus would not go to sleep and so it was impossible for him to make his way to the night and ask for help. Henry fell asleep only to be woken violently by a terrible nightmare. He had seen creatures that would frighten even the bravest of warriors, monsters of the deep that pulled fleets of ships into the dark of the sea. As his terror subsided, he looked over at the abbot, who was sitting with his back against the trunk of a tree, with his hood hanging low over his nose. Presuming Icarus to be asleep, Henry stood up as quietly as he could and walked softly through the leaf-covered ground all the while watching the demon to make sure he was not caught in his retreat. As soon as he had made sufficient ground that he thought it safe to turn, a red glow illuminated the underside of his master's hood. Icarus pulled his hood back to reveal his burning eyes, watching his traitorous servant intently. I was just going to relieve myself, father, Henry said. Icarus did not respond with words. Instead, he held his glare on Henry. Henry made his way back to the place he had been sleeping at, and slept no more for the rest of the night. In the morning, he saw his master lying with his back on the ground. Father, it is day, Henry said, kneeling over the abbot. 
Icarus opened his eyes, feeling the ground around him and proceeding to grasp Henry's arm. The two men made their way back to the main party, who were already up and putting out the fire that had burned throughout the night. Are you ready, father? Falk asked. Yes, Icarus responded. The cohort galloped along the road, eager to make it to the village before nightfall. Stopping only once along the way, the party made it to the village by the end of the day. The village was quiet. Smoke came from the chimneys of each house, rising into the sky. A young boy ran in front of the horses, carrying a pail of water. Boy! Falk beckoned. Yes, sir, the boy replied. We are passing through to the Holy Land and seek hospitality. We have money to give. Go and find us lodgings, Falk commanded. The boy ran off with his pail, placing it at the door of a house and entered it. His father came out shortly after. You men are answering the call of the Holy Father, he asked. That is correct, Falk responded. You have lodging at my house and all the food you need for your travel, he replied. We have coin to pay you for your hospitality, Falk said. The man put his hand in the air as if to decline the offer. The church bell rang and the village square filled with its people. Falk and his company were still on horseback as they made their way towards the gathering. A priest came from the church doors, the crowd opening up for him as he made his way towards the visitors with his arms held open. You, blessed men, you have responded to the Holy Father's call. Please stay as long as you will, though I am sure you wish to make in haste to the Holy Land. You have our hospitality the priest said, prompting the people to erupt into a roar of approval. Thank you, Father. We bring with us two men of the cloth who have lost their home, Falk said. Let them come and counsel with me. As for you, men of arms, I'm sure that you are hungry after such a long journey. I see the good Amadeus has offered his lodgings, and I'm sure that he has an adequate supper to offer. Welcome. Several excited youngsters, driven by the romantic thoughts of battle and the conquistadors before them, gathered around the visitors. They grabbed the reins of the horses to lead their newfound heroes to comfort. Sire, let me escort you. No, sire, please come this way. Shut up, I got here first. Boys, we will tend to ourselves. Later on, once we have eaten, my comrade Charles here will tell you a story that will send shivers down your spine. He is a master storyteller, and if your patience... You are in for a great treat, Falk bellowed, deflecting the attention away from himself and onto his gaunt companion, who upon seeing the children flock to him tried to make a swift escape. Henry and Icarus were welcomed into the church to speak with the priest, who immediately inquired into what Falk had meant by the loss of their homes. It is with great regret that I recount the tale of the night we lost our home. The flames climbed high in the night, and watching on we could do nothing, as the fire climbed higher and higher, relentless in its consumption, Icarus recounted. And the cause of the fire, the priest asked. A great mystery, Icarus replied. Maybe it is a sign, maybe you are being called to the holy war, the priest said. Icarus did not know the priest, but he knew what the priest knew of him. Icarus's monastery had secured the patronage of the wealthy and the powerful, from both the church and the noblemen. The wealth and influence that the blind abbot had built up over time had caused much animosity from a few greedy bishops, a hatred that was more dangerous than offending a powerful lord. Perhaps that is the case, or perhaps the lord wishes for me to start anew, like Job did after he was persecuted so, Icarus replied. The priest tried to hide his anger. He knew what the greedy little abbot was up to. Clearly he had burned his own monastery down to seek the pity of the nobles that had forgotten him. Surely this was his scheme. A grand scheme, thought the priest, to burn everything down, only to rise higher in the aftermath. And what of your young monk, Henry, was it? What can you tell me of this mysterious fire? The priest asked. Henry hung his head low, trying desperately not to make eye contact. "'Twas, as the abbot says, a mystery. A fire that came in the night from where I cannot say," Henry replied. The priest took great solace in Henry's reply. He could see that the young man was hiding something. 
Well, what a terrible calamity to befall such a loyal servant of Christ. I grant you hospitality in the lodgings of the church for as long as you do require, the priest offered. Thank you very much. We only require lodging tonight. Tomorrow I move on, Icarus replied. Why so soon, and to where will you go? You have no home, the priest replied, probing Henry with a sinister look. We go onward, Icarus replied, grabbing hold of Henry's arm and standing slowly. Of course, such devastation might have hurt you deeply. You will be in my prayers, and I pray you rest well tonight, the priest said, rising to his feet as the two visitors left. Falk stood up and proposed a toast to his host, who was beginning to worry about his wine supply. It seemed to Amidus that there was a toast nearly every few minutes, and that whenever there was, the monolith knight would finish another cup of wine. To our host, may you live long, may you have many more children to tend your crop, and may you find warmth in your wife's bed for the rest of your days, Falk toasted, before draining his newly filled cup. The young boy, who had been charged with filling the cups of the men-at-arms and the knight, was amazed by what he saw. He had never seen men drink and eat as much. The pale child stood up, swaying, struggling to keep up with Falk, but enjoying the attempt. To my overgrown friend, who takes better care of his hair than all of the women in Flanders, I say this, may we fight bravely, may we kill swiftly, and may we live long enough to see the holy city in the hands of Christians. The seven men smashed their cups together, spilling wine over the table. Amadeus ushered his wife and children to bed, fearing that the visitors might become increasingly ruckus. After finishing their drinks, the men began to talk of battles past, two falling asleep whilst they did, with their heads on the table. I remember what it was like to first ride into the fray. I was young, and before I arrived at the enemy, I had already pissed my pants. But the wet did not stop me, for as soon as I began to swing my sword, I felt at home, like my life had purpose. Many men try to say they did not fear the first time they went to battle, but I say that these men always turn out to be the greatest cowards. It is the man who can control the fear that creates the most fear in his enemies, Falk said, slamming his cup on the table as he finished. Of the four men listening, only Charles had fought in battle. I know that the first time may be shocking for a child, but I have not fought before. However, I know that I will not hesitate when I do, Edward said. He was tall and skinny and had made a small fortune over the last few harvests. He wanted to move as close to being a knight as he could and as far from being thought of as a peasant as possible. But the escape from his past had proved difficult no matter how much wealth he acquired. The door flung open and standing at it was the blind abbot being shepherded by a young village boy, the warm glow of a setting sun at his back. Falk stood immediately to lend a hand to the man of the cloth, grabbing hold of his arm and leading him inside, with the vigour of a man his size intoxicated, a pace that almost caused Icarus to stumble and fall. Please do join us, father, Falk offered, stopping at a seat near the table. I am tired and need a rest. If there is a room available for me, I would ask that you take me to it shortly, Icarus replied. Amadeus, the host, pointed in the direction of a small room, and Falk hastened to obey the abbot, leading him into the empty room. Amadeus, the host, pointed in the direction of a small room, and Falk hastened to obey the abbot, leading him into the empty room. Where is young Henry? Falk asked. I don't know, I have not seen him for a while, Icarus replied. Icarus knew the boy had gotten away from him and worried that he would tell the priest what he had seen. His only hope of concealment was to wait the night out, hidden from all behind the closed door of his room. Icarus lay on his back listening to the singing and toasting of the holy warriors, hoping that Henry would return soon so that he could determine how much the young man had confessed to the priest. The sun retreated to another part of the world, and as its last light poured into the bedroom, it was replaced by the fiery glow of the abbot's eyes. He looked around the room. Every object was ablaze with light, the intensity so great that Icarus closed his eyes. The men in the next room were becoming less boisterous as they slowly retired to a section of the dining room floor. Charles lay in the corner of the room, 
hugging one of the resident dogs who slept happily, never having received such loving attention. Falk sat at the table, still sipping on his wine, the last man awake. He looked around at his companions and regretted that none of them had been able to stay up and keep him company. He was lonely and had great anxiety about the path ahead of him. Fears that drinking with company quell, but drinking alone only exasperates. The wine had run out and Falk sat at the table, his eyes drooping. His chin hung lower and lower, bouncing upon his chest as his neck gave way to the weight of his head. He heard an approaching noise outside, just as sleep finally descended upon him. The noise intensified and it gradually became clear that it was a mob of villagers congregating around the house. Bring the dear men out here, shouted one man. Bring him now or we'll set fire to the house, another screamed. Falk walked around the room and woke his companions up one by one. What is it? Charles asked. There is a mob out there and they are calling for us to bring out a demon. They have gone mad, Falk replied. Someone has to go out there, Edward suggested. I'll go, but get your arms ready, Falk replied. Falk slowly opened the door and as he stepped outside he was met by an angry gathering of all the men and women from the village. They were holding burning torches and most of them had makeshift weapons in their free hands. At the front of the mob stood the priest and behind him there was a large man holding the end of a rope which led to a noose around Henry's neck. What is the meaning of this? Falk asked. The men slowly started pouring out of the house, standing at his side with their swords brandished. The priest turned to the crowd and with his finger over his mouth encouraged them to silence. I have it on confession from the young monk Henry that his master Icarus, the abbot, made a deal with the devil and in doing so burned his own monastery to the ground. Furthermore, he entered the flames as the building burned and walked through the fire untouched. Clearly, again, evidence of the works of the devil, the priest said. That sounds more like a miracle than the devil's work to me, Charles shouted. Do not mock me. There is more. At night time, the abbot, Icarus, his eyes are taken over by flames. He is possessed by the devil. The priest cried out. This is nonsense. I saw the abbot this evening and his eyes were pale white with blindness. I led him to his room, Falk replied. There is only one way to settle this then. Bring him over here and we will all know who is wrong and who is right, said the priest. There is no need. Here I stand, Icarus cried out from behind Falk and his men. They moved away from the door and slowly Icarus was revealed behind them, standing at the door with his hood hung low over his eyes. He held his sword with two hands, the point sticking into the ground and the hilt resting against his stomach. You see... What does a man of the cloth do with a sword? Should not his godly conduct defend him? Why require a weapon? This is not a man of God, the priest cried out. What evidence do you have to accuse me of being the devil's spawn? You are in fact the man who should be brought into question. What are those pricey items strung around your neck and arm, hidden by your robes? Are such items of gold and silver to be in the possession of a man of God? One can only wonder how you came into the possession of such wealth. Icarus cried out, and as he did, the glow below his hood intensified. You see, his eyes are on fire, and he can see underneath my robes. This is the devil's work, the priest cried out. So you believe he can see under your robes? Falk asked. Yes, you have heard him, the priest said. So then you admit he is right about the riches you are hiding? Falk asked. The priest went quiet. Then, with a flash of anger, he turned to the people behind him. The devil has come into your village. If you do not cut him down, then God will never forgive your souls. The people became restless, whispering amongst themselves. Let us kill the demon, one man yelled. Kind people, I brought the abbot to your village under my protection, and I will not let you harm him, Falk said. Then you must die too, a woman screamed. Kill the devil and his protectors, another man yelled. Father, go inside, Falk urged Icarus. Before he could make sure Icarus had listened, Falk turned to face the assailing mob. 
Charles commanded the men to stay together, and just as they had regrouped, a multitude descended upon them. They cut their opponents down one by one, and although the villagers were scarcely armed, their number was great, and even for the skilled warriors the onslaught became overwhelming. Several burning torches had been hurled onto the roof of the house, and with the wood burning at their backs and the mob at their front, the ranks were withering away. Two of them had already been put down, leaving Falk, Charles and Edward to fend the rest off. The mob grew more confident, and after initial fear at seeing how many of them had been killed, they regrouped and surged forward once more. The front door of the house opened and a billow of thick smoke came rushing out as it did. Icarus pushed his way between Charles and Falk, and with one downward swing he cut a man in half, causing both sides of the fighting to stop dead in their tracks with fear. After a brief silence, one man pointed his sword forward and opened his mouth to encourage the people to attack once more. But before he could let out a call, Icarus had moved into the mob and put his sword through the man's heart. Listen, retreat or every one of you will die here tonight, Icarus screamed. Four men surrounded Icarus as he was now in the middle of the villages. They had swarmed him. But before each man could come closer than four feet from him, each of them found their life at end. The slaughter was done with such speed and haste that the remaining villagers followed the priest as he ran off into the forest, leaving the village centre empty and filled with victims of the fighting. The quiet was only broken by the fire as it crackled and unfairly ate its way through the house of the host who had been so generous in his hospitality. Falk, Charles and Edward had walked away from the fire, all of them exhausted from the fighting, all of them transfixed on the otherworldly creature who had caused the violence and had so swiftly put an end to it. What are you then if you are not a demon? Falk asked. Though at this point I can tell you honestly that I do not know what has become of me, I can confess just as honestly that my love for God has not changed and that I am no demon, Icarus replied. And so, how are we to know in fact that you are not deceiving us? Charles asked. Why would I have come to your aid if I was bound to the devil, who does not care for the well-being of any band of good and loyal men? Icarus replied. I am not so convinced. Your eyes, they burn with such an intensity so as to make even the bravest of men stricken with fear, Edward stated. Perhaps you are not the bravest of men, Edward, and maybe you cannot speak on their behalf. For it appears to me that your two companions are not as stricken with fear as you are, Icarus replied. Listen to his cryptic remarks, the way he dances around with his words, surely his tongue is there to divide. Nothing good can come of letting this thing stay alive, Edward said. And yet we are alive because of him. Enough of this nonsense. The priest was not a good man, and the villagers raised their hands against pilgrims travelling to the Holy Land. That is not right. I say we take the abbot with us. We have lost two fighting men, and the journey to Jerusalem will not be a safe one, Falk said. What do we do with him? Charles asked, pointing at Henry, who was lying on the ground in the fetal position. As much as I would like to end his life for his treachery, he is my charge. And though I cannot say right now what use he will be, I can say that it is on my heart to see him accompany me on my journey, Icarus said. Master, thank you, Henry cried. This pathetic heap will only bring trouble, Edward said, his face changing to one of intrigue. Besides, I don't recall the abbot telling us that he was on his way to the Holy Land. He said that he would part ways with us in this village. Where do you plan on going then? Falk asked. What I seek is in Jerusalem, Icarus answered. Then it is settled. We will leave tonight and camp as far away from this treacherous village as we can. There will be retribution to be paid for the slaughter that has happened here, and I want my battles to be fought for the city of God, not on the way there too. And as for those eyes of yours, Father, I recommend that we cover them up as night comes, in case we are set upon again by Christian men that don't feel as convinced as we are about the godly nature of your condition, Falk stated.